Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome along to DBA Fundamentals Down Under. This month, we've got Matt Gordon talking to us about where should my data live and why. My name's Warwick Rudd, and I'm your host. I'll hand over to Matt very shortly. I do have a couple of slides that I need to run through for you, uh, just as a little bit of housekeeping. And so with that, this session is being recorded and will be available for you on the DBA Fundamentals uh, archive site in a couple of days time once this uh, session has finished. If you do have any questions at all throughout the session, I will be monitoring the, uh, the questions. So fire them through and uh, we'll get Matt to answer those throughout the session and at the end of the session. So with that, a big thank you to our sponsors, Century One. Without our sponsors, it makes it difficult to put on these sessions for you. So if you haven't already gone along to Century One's website, they have some fantastic articles, videos, downloads, eBooks to assist you on your learning along the data platform. So with that, stay connected with PAST, and I will hand over to Matt to take you through the next hour of to, uh, this month's presentation. Okay. And it would help if I would unmute, which I've done. <laughs> and I'll show my screen from here. And let me know if you're seeing the proper screen. We are. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, so, yeah, I'm presenting from Eastern Time in, in the States. <clears throat> so if it sounds uh, like my voice is a little scratchy and it's a little late, that's because it is. And it is. Uh, but thanks for spending the next hour with me. Um, I do like a interactive talk. So if there's any questions you have, uh, the questions pane here in the GoToMeeting app, uh, just go ahead and punch those in there. We'll try to take a break or two here just to cover those. Um, so again, thanks for coming to Where Should My Data Live and Why? And let's go ahead and get started. So a little bit about me. Um, I actually started a new job today. So I'm a senior data architect for Insight Digital Innovation. Uh, I'm on Twitter, SQL at speed, and my blog is SQL at speed.com. <clears throat> I will apologize in advance. The blog's been a bit quiet. Uh, it's been pretty intense, uh, both wrapping up the old job and starting the new one but there's going to be some more content out there this month. So pretty excited about some of the stuff that I'll get to write about. Uh, but if you go there and say, hey, this guy hasn't blogged in three months, that's because that's true. And like I said, I apologize in advance. Um, a little bit more about me. So I've been working on SQL Server for about 15 years. Um, I've been a database developer. I've been a DBA. I've been kind of more of a data architect person. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about over this next hour. Um, I've seen from multiple angles and perspectives. So ho I'm hoping that helps you. Um, and hopefully some of the knowledge that, that I have and some of the things that I've seen help you along. Uh, so I'm also an idea at ACE. I'm part of the 2018, 2019 class of that. So if you see me out uh, at some SQL Saturdays and conferences and things like that, that's partially thanks to IDERA. Uh, and also it's just fun to show the duck and talk about the duck. Uh, also, as I mentioned, I'm coming to you from Eastern time here in the States. I'm head of the Lexington, Kentucky pass local group. So if you ever find yourself in central Kentucky for any reason, we would be happy to host you. And we are, as far as I know, the only pass local group in the world that meets in a brewery. So if you're nervous about speaking and think a beer might help with that, we can provide that thanks to some wonderful sponsors that we have. <laughs> anyway, so if you're not familiar with where I'm from, the red state there in the middle <clears throat> is where I'm from. And if you're not familiar with what Kentucky may or may not be known for, there's this. Uh, we're known for Kentucky Fried Chicken pretty much everywhere. We're known for bourbon whiskey, if you're into spirits at all. And we're known for the Kentucky Derby horse race here in, in the States. So just a little bit about where I'm from and where I'm coming to you from tonight. Uh, you may have noticed, as I mentioned, that my Twitter handle and blog URL are the same, SQL at speed. 
And I do that just to set up the next slide because I like to show pictures of race cars. So uh, when my work and family schedule allow, uh, sometimes I drive cars fast. So as much as I love talking about data and things like that, um, I really love talking about race cars. This is obviously not the venue for that, but if you have questions about any of that or just want to talk about fast cars, uh, you guys know how to find me now. So with that, <clears throat> let's dive into the agenda uh, for the next 55 minutes or so. So we're going to go through a few things. We're going to talk about where does our data live now. And just to before we get too deep in into this, uh, my intention for this session, and it draws kind of varying crowds, my intention for this session has always been to talk about, you know, to talk to maybe DBAs and data folks that are very focused maybe on an on an on-premises type solution, or they've got a blend, but, uh, you know, a very fixed, like, well, we put this type of thing on-prem, we put this type of thing in Azure or, or in Amazon. Um, and, and, you know, that's just what we do. So the session is kind of trying to break you out of that mold and think about well, what are you doing? Where are you, where are you deploying your different, the different parts of your data estate and, and why? Um, so we're going to talk about where our data lives now. We're going to talk about why our data does live where it does. I have a very brief GDPR related session, uh, section. Um, and then we'll talk about then we'll get into kind of some of the hybrid things I've seen as a consultant, different deployment options, kind of my thoughts on those. And if, as as is happening a lot now, you know, if you're into uh, or if your manager has come to you and said, listen, your goal for, you know, calendar year or fiscal year or whatever, 2019 is – you know, we want some data out in, in the cloud or we want or we want a hybrid cloud or we something like that. Just talk about some ways to kind of do that in ways that might be more comfortable and still kind of teach you a lot about how we do that. I've got a couple case studies about deployments and things that I've seen and then a wrap up. And as I mentioned, Q&A is welcome throughout. Um, I'll try to take a break or two just to kind of see if we've got anything. I know I know the time skew here across the world can can be a bit weird, but any questions you have, feel free to throw them out. And if we can handle them in this venue, great. Uh, and if not, then that's an excellent excuse for me to write another blog post. So before we dive into this, um, and I know this is the boring chart. A lot of folks, when we talk about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and all that, like the pizza chart. Uh, seems like most folks worldwide uh, like pizza. <laughs> but so I've gone with kind of the boring chart here because I do think just for me, it kind of sets uh, it kind of sets up better of what we're talking about here. So when we're talking about things that are deployed on-prem, that's that entire left column. And we manage all of it. So between, you know, maybe data professionals like us, maybe a storage team, operations team, Windows team, all that stuff. Uh, we're managing all of it. So it's networking, storage, all, all the bare metal stuff, virtualization if it's involved, operating system, apps, and data. So that's most likely what uh, most of us on this call are used to. Um, infrastructure as a service kind of takes the bottom half of that chart out. So the bare metal stuff we're not worried about, but we're operating system up. So we're still patching the operating system. You know, if we've installed something like SQL Server there, we're patching it, we're maintaining it, all those sorts of things. Platform as a service is where you really kind of cross the threshold from, you know, infrastructure as a service. Yeah, you've deployed it in the cloud, but it's still, in general, maybe for a data professional, everything we're used to interacting with or most things. Platform as a service is a bit of a change for us <clears throat> in that we're talking about just managing the data and the applications. So everything below that, it's not magic, but we're not handling it. So platform it as a service, you know, for the purposes of this talk is a cloud vendor handling that for us. And just so you know, just to kind of set this up in this talk, as completely as I can, I try to, uh, talk about the Microsoft offerings, the Amazon offerings, and the Google offerings, where those apply. Um, I try not to pick favorites. There is kind of one section where I talk about one vendor that I think may be more helpful in a particular area. 
Um, but I do, you know, because I know people come from different shops. You've got different contracts and all that sort of thing. So I, I try not to make this a Microsoft centric session, except in most likely most of us are coming from the SQL Server world. So we're kind of focused on that as a start and then deploying that from here on. Uh, just kind of for continuity of the chart, I've got software as a service over there on, on the right. That we're not going to talk about that much here, but in that we're really not managing any part of that. So for the purposes of this talk, we're going to stop at PaaS. Um, but software as a service is there kind of for your reference to understand where the continuum kind of runs to. Okay. So here's some discussion points just to kind of have in mind while we go through the next bit. The cloud is not magic. So we're going to talk about some stuff that's really cool. We're going to talk about some economies of scale that you get from deploying things in, in the cloud and all those sorts of things. But in reality, it's just a computer that belongs to somebody else in a data center that belongs to someone else. So you want to talk about things, and we're not going to touch that a lot here, but when you hear about things that are serverless and things like that, still running on hardware somewhere and it still belongs to somebody so while some of this stuff is really really cool and really expands the tool set that we have to you know come up with solutions for customers and users and things like that it's not magic it's just a computer that lives somewhere else also and this talk has changed i think the first time i gave it uh, was in the fall of 2017 this talk has changed every time that i've done it and that's a reminder that rapid development from all these cloud providers that are competing with each other in a lot of the spaces that we're going to talk about and many that we're not, um, that constantly expands our options too. Whether it's price, you know, there's can be a bit, bit of a price war in some of the sectors or just offerings and things that they do. Um, you know, there's, we always have more tools than we had even the last week. And so that's something to, keep in mind. The third point, and uh, this is kind of the last two are what I really want you to take away from this slide, kind of have in the back of your mind as, as we go on here. So are we locked in the deployment locations for certain platforms? When I go on site with a lot of customers, and this is just a couple examples here in, in the sub bullets, a lot of customers say, well, we're deploying SQL Server on-prem, or we're deploying it in an IaaS VM. Well, why are you doing that? Well, we've always done that which may or may not be a valid reason, but you know what I want people to walk away from this talk with is you know, why are we doing that? Are there reasons we haven't thought about? Are there things that we haven't thought about that may help us with some of the other options we have? And so just you know, say, well, we're always spinning up Hadoop clusters in the cloud because it's easier. We're always doing database engine on-prem because it's easier. You know, maybe that is or isn't right. And Despite what any salesperson might tell you, one of these platforms may not be completely the right answer. Blending might be the right answer. Or say you've chosen a vendor and for whatever reason that vendor fits, but maybe you need to deploy some things with IaaS, some things in a PaaS offering. Just, you know, it, it it's important to get outside of our comfort zone. This, these things are changing so fast that if we get comfortable and say, well, I've deployed this the last two years, we've always done this the same way the last two years, may not be the right answer now. So just to underscore, kind of the whole point of this talk is, is to break the mold that's in your mind of, well, you know, we need to do this the same way we've always done it. If you take nothing else away from any of the techie stuff that I'm going to talk about, just, you know, if you take a second to consider where you're deploying stuff now, then I'll consider my job done here. So where does our data live now? And unfortunately, this is kind of the interactive part. Um, in this venue, it doesn't really work very well. So I'll just kind of go over these. And if you want to throw some things in, in the chat window, um, I can have a brief look at them. But it's interesting to see while you're kind of thinking over what these questions are, how this has evolved from, you know, I've been giving this talk probably a year and a half. This slide has not changed, but what has changed is the answers that I get. So I still talk to rooms where, you know, I'll ask how many of you do not have a single data environment in, in, in the cloud, and a lot of hands still go up, and that's fine. There's a lot of different reasons for that. You know, depending on, on the country or region that you live in, there might be 
regulatory things, um, you know, it's specific to the industry maybe that you're in, if you're in finance or healthcare, um, again, depending on the country or region you might be in, can be very specific regulations tied to that about data ownership, data location, things like that. And so there, you know, there's some good reasons for that, but kind of those middle three points where I start talking about, well, do you have test ever QA out, out in the cloud? Or do you have a production environment, but it's kind of the trial balloon? Or do you have all your production data environments out there? <clears throat> There's a big shift there. So I understand for a lot of companies where uh, the people on this call might be, you know, it's not a compelling reason to say, well, everybody else is doing it. But kind of for our purposes here, we're just talking amongst ourselves. There's a big shift in those middle three bullets there. And if even if you're professionally not at a place where they're like, well, we're deploying everything on-prem or we only trust IaaS, we're definitely not doing anything with Azure SQL DB or Amazon RDS or anything like that. Perhaps um, as a data professional, you might want to start to explore those on your own because what you don't want to do is get caught out and have you know, your company be very comfortable and set in their ways of where things are being deployed and run and all that, <clears throat> but you've kind of missed the boat in terms of where the rest of the industry has gone. So I won't do kind of a call and answer poll here, um, but just in the context of these questions, I want you to kind of realize the direction a lot of the industry is moving. And this is, you know, I do a lot of SQL Saturdays here here in the States, and I do, I've done some speaking in Europe as, as well, and that's consistent. Uh, whether you're here in, in the States or or across the ocean. So the <clears throat> the movement is definitely more towards cloud-based things and honestly more towards platform as a service-based things. So, you know, we could talk more about that, especially if you have questions about that. Um, just, you know, just kind of telling you what I've seen there. So why does our data live where it does? And before I dive into this section, I'll say I'm very open to any argument that anybody has. Um, these are pros and cons for on-prem and cloud and kind of hybrid deployment that I've seen as a consultant and stories that I have. Um, but I'm always open to arguments because I think it makes my talk better. It makes it makes everything better when we're all kind of talking about you know what we've seen and, and what we think makes sense and doesn't. So let's talk about what can be perceived as the pros of on-premises deployment. And I'll kind of preface this slide by saying, from a data professional standpoint, a lot of us technically probably don't agree with anything you're seeing there, or maybe don't agree with most of it. But you know, both in my roles before I got into consulting and then once I got into consulting after that, you know, part of part of what you have to do is not just come up with the best technical solution, but you have to sell it to management. And I think at any level, no matter where we are, you're selling your good idea, you're selling your solution to somebody, whether it's a technical manager, the CFO, the CIO, CTO, whatever role you're in, whatever level you're at, you're selling that to somebody. So this particular slide, and you'll see there's two things in quotes. These come from managers and executives that I had to deal with that, that said exactly that. So from there, we'll dive right into cost. <clears throat> so what's a pro of on-premises stuff? Well, you're leveraging an investment you already have and note that investment is in quotes. So I have a particular story about a company that I used to work with and they had invested heavily in some on-premises uh, spinny disk sands. And we had a particular application we were supporting that, that used that environment quite extensively. We had done a lot of analysis and performance improvements and kind of re-architecting to get it to a point where moving it to something like Azure SQL DB from both a performance and cost standpoint made a lot of sense. And so technically, the technical folks felt good about it and went up the chain to our executives and said, listen, we're spending you know, this much money to maintain the SAN. We're gonna spend this much money to re-up maintenance and replace some of the components and things like that in, in a few months time. <clears throat> that doesn't make sense. And so we would like to move portions of this to the cloud, to a platform as a service offering where it makes more sense. And what came back to us is well, we've already invested X millions in a spinny disk SAN. We want to continue leveraging that investment. 
So from the technical side, that didn't make a lot of sense to us because we knew what we were talking about from a service tier standpoint with Azure SQL DB was likely to be on solid state disks. And we'd done enough testing to know that was going to be an improvement and a cost savings you know, from the financial numbers that we had. <clears throat> but management didn't see it like that. You know, the technical stuff was a bit lost on them where we're talking about differences in milliseconds and things like that, even though we were supporting an application where the SLA was tenths of a second for particular types of transactions, milliseconds didn't really resonate with them. But the amount of money, the number of zeros after the checks that they had written resonated a lot. So leveraging that investment on cost made sense to them. So it could potentially be a pro. And if you feel like your application is in a good spot, your data is you know, in a good spot where you can maybe go to you know, like an ISVM or a platform as a service offering and save money, be prepared to make that argument. And like I said, you can contact me offline. I can tell you specifically some of the detailed arguments I've made on this. Uh, suffice to say, we lost that one. <clears throat> I haven't lost this ar argument since. <laughs> so that's part of the reason that I do this talk because uh, I want to help people kind of get over some of the barriers that I had. Truth be told, if uptime's not critical, sometimes that cost that you've already sunk into an on-premises thing, it could be a pro. Maybe you know, putting it out in Azure and getting the the, the availability you get out there it doesn't make sense. It's not worth the money. Um, it just depends on the application you're supporting, the SLAs, things like that. <clears throat> Along those same lines, there could be a comfort level with executives and things like that. If it's on-prem, they can go see it. And I worked at a place, you know, we had a server room. We had two windows in, in the front wall, which also sets up the next bullet. But that's a story that I'll get to here in a minute. Um, they could look in there and say, there's all the blinky lights. You know, I know that those are servers that are serving these clients and, and these contracts and all that. <clears throat> and they like that. So we talked about, well, it's going to be in Azure and it's going to be in maybe U.S. East or U.S. West or something like that. They can't go see that. They don't even know exactly where it is, um, and especially from executives, you know, who weren't completely up with kind of all the technological um, improvements that there was a level of distrust there. Well, I don't know. I don't even know where that is. I can't find it on on a map, but I know where this is and I can go look in a window and see it. Yeah, that's a real argument that we have to make, and it is it can be a pro. Uh, physical control and security. So I have a couple stories here. There is there are at least regulations in in the states, <clears throat> particularly if you're in the financial industry and doing certain types of things, where there are very strict regulations on where your data lives and who owns it. So in some cases, and now the cloud providers kind of go to a lot of effort to make sure this doesn't happen, <clears throat> but it can matter um, who owns the building and where the space is and things like that. So that's one thing to consider. And, you know, I don't want to be the consultant who stands up in front of a crowd and says, yes, no, all your data should be in the cloud because the cloud's better and it's cheaper and it's faster and it's magic and it's awesome. Because I recognize there are industries and particular parts of industries where that's not the right answer. <clears throat> but I did work for a company where the physical control and security was presented to us as a as a positive. Like I, we should not go to the cloud because we have spent all this money securing our data center and it's got all the proper cooling and fire suppression and all that. We we've got badge access, we've got bars across the two windows that there are and all that. And that was all wonderful, except if you knew that building well, and I won't tell you where it is, because it's not this way anymore, but just in case they've gone back, um, <clears throat> there was there were of course four walls on the server room. Three of them were built to the highest specs, you know, everything you'd want. They did things, they upgraded from a data center that really was that in name only to a proper data center, except the back wall backed up to a supply closet. And if you knew about the supply closet and were motivated to break through some drywall, <clears throat> you could break through the drywall of the closet and the server room, Kool-Aid man style, like, oh yeah break through those walls and the, the room that they were convinced was in their physical control and secured to the highest level, no expense spared. Um, you could quite easily 
break into it and steal a bunch of servers. Thank goodness nobody did that, because as far as we know, the only ones of us that were aware were the ones actually taking care of the servers, did not wish for them to be stolen. But when a manager comes to you and says, listen, part of the pro of having this on-prem is that we control and secure this, and we know everything that comes and goes, we know how it's designed, make sure you take a look at that and see if there are flaws in that that maybe they haven't thought of. And sometimes it takes a bit of a devious mind to think of that, and the executives and folks in charge may not have that, but probably a lot of us do. <laughs> uh, so another couple of pros before we move on to cons is if you need the data accessible when all external telecom is down, having your data deployed on-prem can make sense. It would make sense to argue against a cloud deployment at that. And I had a customer once upon a time um, they did uh, some telecom related things. Their data center was in uh, North Central Africa. And they recognized that the local power grid, not on schedule, but fairly reliably went down for about a day every month. But they needed to continue to do their work and get you know, all of their work and all their reports and bills and things out <clears throat> when the telecom came back. And so cloud deployments did not make sense for them. That data needed to be in-house because they had a generator. They were prepared for this, but they needed to continue to execute their work while maybe stuff outside their four walls wasn't great. And so that, that can be a real pro here. And if, if it was up in Azure, then they're sitting idle for a day and in their business, they really couldn't afford that. The last pro, and this is a point of debate for sure, is that a lot of managers and executives that I talk to, the licensing on-prem makes more sense to them. You know, we can talk about whether it does actually make more sense or they're listening to the right people or the wrong people or whatever, but just this can be a pro. They've dealt with this for a while. They kind of understand that model and it makes sense. You know, they've, they've been re-upping a contract for a long time with kind of variations on like a per core, per, per pair of cores model. And that's something we have to recognize as we think about, you know, even if we're proposing the best technical solution, how do we convince those people that you know, maybe they're wrong or maybe they're right. So let's talk about some cons. The cons to deploy on-prem is generally it requires an upfront investment that's large. If you haven't made that investment already, it's it can be quite expensive to build out data centers and do all the things that the next bullet point talks about. You've got to buy racks, you've got to cool it, you've got to cable it. You need to make sure the network infrastructure is sufficient to serve whatever customers you have. If a fire breaks out, you need to be able to put that out. All that stuff costs money. So if you have a data center, you know, a lot of that's taken care of. If you don't, you're building that out, <clears throat> then it, you know, it could be a real con to on-prem, no matter what kind of safety and security and comfort level your executives might have, you're spending real money here. And the reason I kind of list that out in that bullet. So when I've gone to customers who were involved in that decision, a lot of times this is the stuff, the stuff that gets forgotten about. They're thinking about, well, maybe they're thinking about racks and they're thinking about servers and they're thinking about licensing, but they're forgetting about all the stuff that makes a proper data center go that supports customers the way we need to. And depending on what industry you're in, what type of application you're supporting, you may need a backup data center to do all this twice over. So that can double and then some, depending on where it needs to be, what these costs are. Beyond all that, if you're deployed on-prem, I have a lot of good friends that are in ops and I want them all to have awesome jobs. But the reality is, and another thing that gets left off budget line items, is you need on-site personnel to maintain everything we just talked about, let alone you know replacing drives and memory chips and all those sorts of things that can go wrong that we can hot swap now, but you still need somebody to do it and understand that it happened, understand that it broke, know what part to switch, all those sorts of things. So that can be a con. Those folks cost money and maybe you'd want people with those skills deployed somewhere different. So all in all, from a resource perspective, deploying things on-prem can be more expensive. So let's talk about some cloud pros. The pro is you can buy only what you need. So, <clears throat> you know, previously, if we were suggesting a proof of concept to our manager, whether it was maybe some open source monitoring tools or, you know, anything we wanted to try that we needed servers for, we had to go maybe hope some servers had been um, taken offline or sunsetted from some other application, hope they were modern enough to support what we were trying to do, hope we could borrow them for the purposes that we need or failing all that 
that we could justify our proof of concept enough to justify some expenditures, to get us some servers, some licenses, all those sorts of things. Whatever we had suggested that we thought would help, it was going to cost money up front. It was going to cost a lot. And if we were wrong, if the proof of concept proved that you know our estimates were not correct, then <clears throat> you know we're out. The company's out a fair amount of money, and they they're not sure what they gain from that. So the pro of the cloud is if you have an idea, whether it's related to an application or supporting an application or something like that, you can say, "Listen, I'm going to spin up a database. Maybe you need some web servers or something like that. I'm going to spin that up for a limited period of time, limited cost." And I'm going to kill it at the end, and we're going to talk about whether it made sense or not, and go from there. So you're not, you haven't bought hardware and licenses that you potentially may not need. So that's a pro. Um, we're all fairly familiar, you know, with the scalability of of the cloud, both vertically and horizontally. It's one of the real benefits. <clears throat> you know, we talk about scaling on prem, and that this is changing a bit in general you're buying more stuff you're spending a lot more money just like going back to my race cars you know to a certain extent how fast do i want to go well how much budget do you have you know you have budget for all the latest parts and all the latest things scaling servers on prem is pretty similar do you have budget for oh i need the latest servers i need the fastest ram i need the best storage um where when you're talking about a cloud provider a lot of times you're just turning a dial or you're pulling a slider and saying, I need more horsepower for this particular thing, then you can turn it down. <clears throat> so where on-prem, you know, if you're in like a retail environment, and I've, I've supported some retail providers um, here in the States, like the day after our Thanksgiving is a significant retail day um, in general. And there's a bit of argument about, about this, but in general, it's as busy as you'll ever be. So you're buying all your on-premises hardware to support that one day because you have so many new customers and returning customers coming to your site to do stuff. And if you let them down that day, they may not come back. They may go to another vendor. So you're spending all that money to do that. And even when you virtualize things, things like that, you're buying a lot of overhead in reality for maybe just a few days a year. Or when you talk about the cloud, you know, you're borrowing on all of that hardware that is maybe devoted to other things at other times, <clears throat> but you can just kind of turn it up and say, listen, I know these two days are going to be really busy and I'm going to turn that dial and give my customers what they need and then turn it back down and give my management what I need and save them some money. So you know, there's something to be said for the scalability of the cloud and the ease of it. You don't have to requisition anything. You don't have to put in bids. Just turn a dial and hope that it's approved. <laughs> um, <clears throat> This mid bullet, the first few times I gave this talk, it was not in here, but it was an excellent point somebody gave, I think probably the third time I gave it. And this is not for every industry. So the, the use case is limited. When you're talking about something where you need globally redundant storage, if you try to do that in an on-premises type environment, even if you're with a very large customer with infrastructure around you know around the globe globally redundant storage is a you know somewhat difficult and fairly expensive problem to solve <clears throat> in the cloud it's not the providers have already done this work for us so if you need globally redundant storage you will not be able to beat the cost going to your boss and say all right well we've got four data centers in these places and here's what we need to buy everywhere to make this happen because <clears throat> they're going to say listen in azure it's a switch you know, we just have to write a check. Um, you know, we can turn this on and it's everywhere we need it to be. We just have to pay for it. And it's not inexpensive, uh, but it's a pro just from an ease of use. And again, you can kind of turn it on and off. If you need it at certain times or for certain applications or whatever, you don't have to make that um, <clears throat> available across your data estate. If you need data available from all locations, then the cloud is kind of a natural thing, especially if you're maybe trying to shard data, you know, again, if you're in retail or something where you need data available to customers at a place where it's convenient for them for performance reasons and things like that, cloud kind of lends itself to that. All the providers that we're going to talk about later, Google, Microsoft, Amazon have data centers all over the world generally. And so if you have customers all over the world, you can serve that data to them uh, and maybe take a few seconds off their customer experience. And maybe they're more likely to use your application or buy your goods or whatever it may be. <clears throat> the second to last bullet here, um, 
I was fortunate enough to give this talk to the Washington DC user group. And uh, Washington DC here in the States is obviously where our federal government is. So the vast majority of their members, or at least the members that were uh, there at my talk that night, worked for government agencies. And some of them pointed out that for some of the agencies they worked for, um, on-premises or infrastructure as a service, SQL Server installations, <clears throat> were not satisfactory anymore to any of the security audits and approvals that they had to pass. And that uh, in this case, Azure SQL DB um, and Amazon RDS fits this bill as well, were the only satisfactory things from a security perspective. So if they were creating new databases or new data-driven applications, they could not do the traditional you know, IaaS or on-prem deployment of SQL Server and install databases on an instance, they needed to do either Azure SQL DB or Azure Managed Instance or the Amazon kind of flavors thereof. I found that really interesting. It might not apply across countries um, or even industries and things like that, but, you know, for kind of the impression that's out there that that's, the security in the cloud uh, maybe is lacking, um, you know, at least the federal government here kind of sees it the other way. And we'll talk more about that on a slide or two. Last point I want to get to before we talk about some cloud uh, cons is that high availability and disaster recovery are often built in. So we talked about globally redundant storage and things like that. Well, some of the hater pieces can be built in. I put an asterisk here for a reason, though. I give a lot of talks about always-on availability groups and kind of high availability and disaster recovery thought processes and, and things you should do. Um, unfortunately, what I've seen is we'll go to a customer and say, listen, we're proposing this in Azure, and you're going to deploy this here and this in this region and all these sorts of things. And the response that we get is, <clears throat> well, I don't need to pay for a disaster recovery option, or I know you've built some things in here to make it more highly available or more resilient to disaster. I don't need any of that because the cloud doesn't break. It's wrong. <laughs> like we said, clouds are just computers. They're just servers that belong to somebody else, live somewhere else. They can still break. Perhaps more has to go wrong, but you need to think about, you know, there's more tools available for us to keep data available to our users, but we also need to think about what can go wrong and, and not, and kind of see beyond like the marketing magic of, of what the cloud is. So we'll talk about some cons um, and then I'll take a break for questions here in a minute. So cloud con can require robust internet connectivities depending on the application, like the customer I referenced earlier where they knew their internet, uh, their telecom was dodgy. Um, you know, that w would not have been the right answer for them. If you're supporting an application where uh, you need a VPN to access this stuff. That cost uh, can be significant. And that's, again, I, and I try to kind of highlight this in here. That's something that's easily left off a project budget line item. You say, like, oh, we're going to deploy this in Azure, and it's this many hours and this many terabytes and whatever, and you forget, you know, oh, we require a VPN. And it's, it, you know, that line item is significant and often left out. There's you know, minimal to no control over underlying infrastructure um, on IaaS and then certainly on PaaS. That can be a pro, right? But it can also be a con, uh, depending on what the perspective is, especially the company you're at and how much information they might want you to have. Uh, but it can be a con. You know, there's nothing, <clears throat> there's nothing you can fix if something out of your control is going wrong, which kind of leads into the next bullet. Noisy neighbors, uh, ideal you know, a lot with Azure and some with AWS as well. Noisy neighbors in the early days of Azure was a thing. Um, it's a lot less of a thing now, but you'll know when you provision a virtual machine, especially on Azure, you know, it will, it will say, it will list a certain amount of IOPS, but it will say up to. So if you deal in an environment like I used to, where we are, our SLA was tenths of a second on particular types of, transactions. So we need to have a really definite answer on what our storage could do, the IOPS that it made available to us to do the database transactions. If you're in an environment like that where you know milliseconds really matter, even though Azure VMs and stuff are very tightly controlled and noisy neighbor thing is not really a thing, it's enough of a thing where if 
10, 15 milliseconds matters, maybe the, the cloud's not right for you. And even if your manager's saying, listen, we need to be there, it's your job to step up and say, well, we, we're not going there and, and here's why. From a development perspective, we need to talk to our app teams and make sure they deal with connection hiccups more efficiently. So if you're coming from a world where the database server lives across the data center or in a, the rack next to the web servers, connection hiccups probably aren't as much of a thing. But if the web and database servers are in Azure, or like we're gonna talk about in, in a few slides where one's on-prem and one's not, then those connection hiccups need to be dealt with gracefully. Uh, we've talked about the perception of lighter security, things like that. Can be a con because if our managers believe it, no matter how we come to them and say, you know, moving to Azure, moving to Amazon is going to save us this this much money and, and this much time, and it's going to perform this much better. If they think the security isn't up to par. It's up to us to do our homework to explain to them why the security is sufficient. And I'll, I go into it on the next few slides, but all the providers now carry, to be honest, uh, more security certifications than most private data centers that I've ever worked with. And we've already touched on this a bit. One of the cons can be things happen by magic. So managers <clears throat> will kind of direct you to make mistakes in terms of provisioning things and things like that because they think the cloud never breaks, never dies. And it does. It just dies differently and more in a more complicated fashion, but it can die. So on that note, I'm going to take a drink of water because I realize my throat is getting scratchy and see if we have any questions. At this stage, nobody's asking any questions, Matt. Okay, well, that gave me enough time to drink some water and we'll go on from there. <laughs> so I do a very light touch and these GDPR slides are really more for reference than anything else. So I'm not going to read through them, or really talk about them to any great extent. So my general impression, and we'll kind of uh, bounce through these slides here, is that in terms of dealing with the data requests you can get as a result of GDPR, which you know obviously affects folks in the EU more than anybody, but if you're working for a company anywhere who has data that lives in the EU, this affects you too, even if you're not based there. Um, in general, my thought is, and again, I'm happy to have the argument on or offline, I think the Azure tooling is friendlier to deal with those sorts of requests. And on that note, let's talk about how we can deploy this stuff. So we've talked a lot about process and how to argue with managers and, and what they might think and what we might think and all that stuff. So let's get into kind of the techie goodness here in the last 20 minutes or so. And so you'll see the way these slides kind of line up. I've tried to equate the offerings across the different providers in the same columns. They don't all have the same offerings, and you'll see that here. I've tried to keep this as up to date as I can. Um, if you see anywhere that I've left out, uh, please do let me know. Um, and I'm happy for any feedback. And as I always joke, if you think the talk was great, tweet at me and say it was a great talk. If you think it was terrible and all my information was wrong, send me an email, but don't tweet that. <laughs> But either way, I, I've, I've tried to keep up to date with this. Like I said, this is changing a lot. So if you if you see anything here, definitely let me know via whatever method works for you. So again, SQL Server in the IaaS deployment, very similar to anything we would do on-prem. The machine's in Azure, but we have full control of configuration, maintenance, things like that. Um, if we have anybody using um, Azure SQL DW, then you know, if you came from like a Microsoft a APS or something on-prem, there are cloud flavors of that. I'll touch on these lightly. Um, I, you know, not a, lot, not a lot of folks I talk to have to support an environment where this exists. But if you do, this reference is on the next few slides. More interesting to most folks is Azure SQL DB. So that's the platform as a service flavor, the SQL Server database. As we've talked about, platform as a service, uh, control of maintenance is very limited. Control and configuration, very limited as well, though there are some switches we can throw. <clears throat> if Hadoop is part of your infrastructure, then Microsoft's flavor <clears throat> is known as HD Insight. Though to be honest, if you're interacting with HDFS, there's a multitude of options on Azure that really belongs to its own talk. So I'm not doing it justice to put it in three bullet points in a column here. But in general, um, there are ways to connect SQL Server to semi-structured data and polybase is our way to do that. 
if you're in an Amazon shop or you're kind of uh, examining which cloud provider might might be best, uh, SQL Server on EC2 is is their IaaS offering. And again, that offers us full control of configuration and maintenance. If you're dealing with an MPP data warehouse, then Amazon Redshift is the equivalent of Azure SQL DW that we talked about on the last slide. But again, probably more relevant to this group here is Amazon RDS. So that's the Amazon PaaS offering. Um, differing from Azure, so I, I know that Microsoft obviously supports SQL Server, which is probably why most of us are here. And there's some support, and they've bought some companies for Postgres as well. Uh, Amazon RDS actually supports six different database engines. So if you're in more of kind of a heterogeneous shop um, and you've got to support a lot of different things and you're looking at moving a lot into the cloud and maybe into a platform as a services offering, uh, despite the fact that my current company is Microsoft partner, uh, Amazon does offer some more flexibility there depending on what your environment is. Um, and again, I've got the Amazon kind of HD Insight equivalent there. In general, when I give this talk, there's not a lot of people interested in that fourth column. So we we'll use that as a transition to move on to the next slide. So Google Compute Engine. There is SQL Server on Google Cloud Platform. That is their IaaS offering. It's everything we just talked about. Um, the, in the MPP DW space, there's Google BigQuery. Um, there's some differences there. Again, probably not super relevant to this group, but for those folks that are interested, uh, BigQuery really needs a lot of data to perform well and behave the way that you want it to. Don't really reference it in this talk for that reason. Generally, you're talking petabytes or more. Um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of folks that I talk to in talks like this, they're not dealing with petabytes of data. So we'll just kind of skip that over. Uh, Google Cloud SQL is their platform as a service offering. Supports MySQL and Postgres. Not SQL Server yet. I've got to believe, and I have zero inside knowledge on this, but I've got to believe support for SQL Server would be coming. It's, you know, fairly competitive um, offering in the space between Microsoft and Amazon. And what all the cloud providers seem to like to do is try to get in on where other people are succeeding in this business. And we've got the Hadoop column there as well. On-prem, so this is really more for reference than anything else. We've talked about all this, um, but this slide's here for your reference. If you want to kind of line those last four slides up, they're designed from that perspective. And so let's get in in the last 15 minutes or so into the deployments that I've seen. So one thing I want to talk about, and it doesn't really belong well on any of the previous slides. So before we get into kind of hybrid deployments and things like that, if platform as a service is interesting to you, but Azure SQL DB you feel like isn't right for you, it doesn't offer you the instance level controls that you need. Um, Azure SQL Database Managed Instance can be potentially a viable option for you. So it, it does provide, you know, it's nearly 100% compatible with on-prem enterprise edition. And there are some differences that probably outside of the scope of this talk, especially given the time we have. Um, but they're, you know, it's it's very, very close. You do get all the platform as a service um, benefits. It's automatically patched, updated, automated backups, high availability, all that stuff. You can use the data migration service, uh, pretty popular and fairly efficient, lift and shift path. So, again, that's kind of a unique to Microsoft offering um, within the SQL Server world. So I do kind of want to call that out. But let's move on to some of the deployment options that I've seen. So, and these, you know, I'll, I'll kind of endorse the ones that I think make the most sense to me, but what, I, what these next few slides are really are a list of what I've seen and, and what I've seen work okay. Um, some I like, some I like less, but they are all functional in all ways. Again, kind of going back to the start of the talk, if your manager has come to you and said, listen, we need some data out in the cloud this year, you know, your bonus rides on it or your salary raise rides on it or your job rides on it. Hopefully not. But some some, you know, something among those three choices. Uh, here's some ways to achieve that. So one thing that I commonly see, because especially as a consultant, sometimes I go to shops where, you know, if the DBA team is there, they're undermanned. Um, they're understaffed. Uh, maybe they're all fairly inexperienced. And so they brought in a consultant for help. 
So a common deployment that I'll see is, well, we've deployed this new application. DBAs are overworked or they're not enough of them or they don't exist. <clears throat> so we've deployed our app servers on-prem because we really like our operations team, Windows, Linux guys, um, guys and girls are sharp. Um, but we don't have enough DBAs or whatever, so we've spun up Azure SQL DB to support the database portion of this, get the automated tuning, some of those sorts of things. None of that stuff is as magic as people like to believe, especially executives, <clears throat> but it does exist, and so they're fond of it. The great thing is it's pretty easy to interact with. Um, it's pretty inexpensive, depending on what service tier you need. It takes all the database management responsibility from devs and ops, people. Now we know the automated tuning and things like that is not, it won't resolve every scenario for you. And to get something purely tuned, you still need experienced DBAs to do that. But if you don't have those, this can be a viable option. And it's a way to say, listen, we've got some data out in, in the cloud, um, you know, without spending a lot of money and a lot of resources to do that. So this solution I'm particularly fond of, and I have a story for this. So availability groups, extending those with Azure replicas. So I supported a customer uh, on a variety of different things that had um, a fairly large contract, um, and I can't really get into the industry that they were in, but the contract was for a lot of money. And I was out there working on several other things. And they had a customer say, listen, they're ready to pull the trigger, purchase our software and and do the, you know, buy the product that, that, that we sell. But their two data centers were approximately 90 miles apart on opposite sides of a river that flooded frequently. So obviously not a great plan to have them there, but the vendor they had had a relationship with for a long time, it's where they were. Vendor had taken good care of them, hadn't proved to be an issue before, so you just kind of roll with it. Um, but I was out there, they were you know, poised to sign this large deal, but the customer they were about to sign a significant contract with stopped at the last minute and said, listen, we have data center proximity requirements for any vendor that we have a relationship with, you don't meet them. And so I was there working on other things. I had done some availability group work for them, but they had a pretty robust deployment of those. DBA team really understood what was going on there, managed failovers well, handled all of that really well. Um, but it didn't solve the problem that the two data centers were 90 miles apart next to a river, the same one. So they came to me and said, listen, we need to solve this. This is a lot of money. <laughs> We'd like to make this right. And, uh, you know, obviously under financial pressure to do that. And so what I recommended and what we ended up instituting was extending the availability groups we had. And again, this does require kind of a minimum um, or maybe more than minimum knowledge of, uh, you know, extending your on-premises infrastructure, authentication, things like that to Azure. They had already crossed that bridge. So it's fairly straightforward for us, and Microsoft actually offers a wizard to do just this, to extend the availability groups they had to Azure replicas and put them in US West, which you know met the proximity requirements for, for the customers. They were really pleased about that, signed the deal, good money, bonuses, all that good stuff. So. If you're managing a, a, you know, if you're handling a well-managed availability group deployment, um, extending that with Azure replicas can be a great way to dip your toe in the cloud and potentially maybe even set the table for some further migrations from that point. Um, and that's, you know, again, beyond the scope of this talk, getting into kind of advanced ways to do that. But when you've extended an AG out in Azure, it can open up your options on what you want to do to maybe keep that data out in the cloud permanently. So let's talk about maybe some easier ways to do that because availability groups uh, do have a certain layer of complexity. A lot of other solutions don't. So replication, not everybody's favorite, definitely not uh, maybe the, the most fun thing to work on uh, depending on how complex the design and topology might be, but it exists. It's common, and most likely the majority of us have supported it at some point and may still be. So to get things easily out into the cloud, you can replicate to an Azure IaaS VM. 
you're not doing anything other than going to your to whoever's asked you and said, listen, I've got data out in Azure. But the replication's the same as anything you've done on-prem. There's a machine, there's an instance, you're tying it to some tables out there, replicating some data. So as the last bullet says there, a great way to ease in the comfort with the cloud. Say, listen, I've got some things out in Azure, I've gone to the portal, I've looked at some stuff, I use Management Studio to connect to a server out in, in the cloud, <clears throat> but you're not really leveraging a lot of what the cloud does. You're just kind of out there in name only. Um, but that's okay. It can be a great way to get started and get comfortable with that stuff. A little more advanced is you can actually replicate to Azure SQL database. And Microsoft has done a lousy job marketing this, but Azure SQL DB can be a replication subscriber. There are a couple of gotchas. And normally, when this is a 75-minute session, there would be a demo right here where I would show you how to do that. There won't be. Um, but I can upload, when I send these slides, I can attach uh, screenshots of the demo that I would normally do. And anybody who's interested can walk through those. And if you have any questions, um, like I said, Twitter, SQL at Speed, blog is SQL at speed .com. You can hit me up that way. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, just a couple of minor gotchas replicating to Azure SQL DB. So let's move on to a couple more uh, while we get through these last few slides. So. Uh, kind of continuing with the theme of technologies that we're all comfortable with that are not super complicated, but get us out in, into the cloud. Just as we can replicate to a VM out in Azure IaaS or Amazon e EC2, uh, we can log ship out there as well. So if you want to copy the data, store it completely offsite, this is a way to get there. So yeah, I talk about kind of dipping your toe in, in the cloud, but this is a way to really have data somewhere else. So if you have you know, SLAs that say you need to have copies of data offsite and things like that. This is kind of a way to kill a couple birds with one stone. And maybe you've got a warm standby here and you also have data that you could document as, you know, completely off any site that you own. Um, and you've expanded your environment and your footprint and you haven't had to set up a cluster or anything like that. This last one I really love, and I've got a quick story about this. So you can use Polybase to connect to Azure Blob Storage. So that this is very much a hybrid option. So we've gone, we're still in the SQL Server ecosystem. Polybase is very much a part from SQL Server 2016 and on of what's in our toolbox to you know access data that's uh, maybe outside our server in different formats and things like that. And without getting too deep into the weeds, um, this gets really exciting in SQL Server 2019. Um, but let's dive into the case study because I really enjoy talking about this. And then just a couple slides after this. So I went to um, here in the States, we have about 20 metropolitan, tra metropolitan transportation planning agencies. And so what they do is they estimate based on st uh, statistical models that they do and say people in this city are going to move out of downtown and into the suburbs or from this suburb to that suburb or whatever. And the outcome of what they do, and they have a lot of very smart people doing this, is then the municipal authority may ask for tax increases to widen roads, build bike paths, buy more buses, build trains, whatever. Um, I went and did a health check. Fairly simple engagement on paper, health check for a bunch of SQL Server uh, instances. They had passed with flying colors. It was an easy week. They said, hey, we have this problem. They had basically gotten a prediction wrong. And so they had um, recommended the widening of a highway that ended up not being actually being used less. And taxpayers were upset. Um, therefore, some politicians that represented those taxpayers were upset. <clears throat> and it kind of set in motion a thing where they had to turn over, they had to archive these models and all the output of their proprietary software for like seven to 10 years. And they were just dumping it into relational tables. They didn't have anything else to do with it. That had been the process. They had been keeping it for 90 days before. So they kept doing it. Well, this was really popular with their storage vendor because they kept buying storage all, all the time. You can imagine the maintenance thing from index maintenance, things like that. Um, it's a huge issue, and they wanted to resolve this. So they said, hey, do you have any kind of off-the-wall idea for what we can do? Like, this works. We're basically paying our storage vendor's salesperson's salary every year. I said, well, we could throw some stuff out in Azure Blob Storage, and this was cold tier. Uh, there's an archive tier now, but it was cold tier then. And it was just CSVs. This thing just outputted giant CSV files. So we threw it out there. So this was still structured data, but not structured in a relational sense like we're used to. Um, threw it out into Azure. 
um, the queries got faster. So they had an SLA that certain query sets had to return in like 30 seconds. On-prem, it returned in 15. From Azure cold tier, it returned in 11 or 12. And as the slide says here, storage costs decreased uh, by 96%. Cold storage is cheap. So that's kind of, that's where I like to leave this. We'll move on. Um, so there's another demo. And again, this, this comes packaged with the other one to talk about how to wire up Polybase to do this. Um, I'll skip over this slide and get straight to the wrap up because that's kind of where I like to leave this talk when I have an hour is to think about, you know, Polybase is not something we might normally think about, but if, you know, data professionals working on SQL Server, there's a lot available to us. Uh, and Polybase is one of those things to deal with semi-structured data in a way that's comfortable to us. We can use T-SQL to talk to it. So again, referring back to those points, you know, we kind of went over those and we talked about how to blend technologies, platforms, things like that. Cloud is not magic. So what are some recommendations you can carry on from here? Set expectations for your management, for your team, what cloud technologies are and what they can do. Um, they're not magic. So especially from an availability and disaster recovery standpoint, what are we doing there? You know, what, <laughs> what additional tools do we have? What additional problems do we have to think about? What additional problems do we have to solve for management? The cloud is not magic. No matter what ad you saw or what TV show you were watching or whatever, um, these things can still break. And, and you have to set expectations, especially based on money spent, service tiers, things like that, of what they're getting. Um, for data professionals, we need to stay abreast of all these new technologies, personal research, training if it's available to you. Um, you're here at a past thing now, so SQL Saturdays, things like that, all these virtual groups, fabulous resources. They're free. Take advantage of all of this. If you're familiar with Azure Stack and you have the budget to support it, this is a way to bring Azure uh, services and tooling in-house with a giant very expensive server, but if you're in an industry that requires things to be on site and you still want the benefits of Azure, the PaaS offerings uh, can bring that in-house. That's the way to do it. And embrace all this. It's a fun time to do what we do. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff that we can do with this. So thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for bearing with me with my slightly scratchy voice. And if there are any questions, I know we're a couple minutes over. I'm happy to take those. Well, Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, so as Matt has mentioned, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the questions window now. Uh, as mentioned at the start of the session, as well as throughout the session, this session has been recorded and will be available on the DBA Fundamentals archive site uh, within a couple of days' time. And we will look at having the uh, slides added along with that so that you are able to see the slides uh, along with the video. <coughs> So with that, if, if there aren't any further questions, thank you all for attending. And I look forward to having you all again next month. Thanks all.